Praise be Jesus Christ. I'd like to go ahead and start this uh, lesson off with the um, student prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas taken from the prayer card, um, St. Thomas Aquinas prayer card. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, origin of all being, graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of my understanding. Take from me the double darkness in which I have been born, an obscurity of sin and ignorance. Give me a keen understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations, and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in the completion. I ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the prayer that we just prayed, it, it, it talks about asking God to point out, point out our beginning, um, you know, direct, direct the progress, um, and help in the completion. And so this lesson is going to be on um, the, what's called the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And, and in these, we'll also talk mainly about purgatory and indulgences, um, because really it's, it's those things, um, purgatory and indulgences, in which we connect to the life of Christ, which is, is God, in His mercy, getting us from point A to point B, point B being heaven, and, and A being our life. And so we move through our life, and God does help with the completion through these great graces. So I want to start by just kind of thinking about our end, thinking about where it is that we're going. And the Catechism uh, speaks of, of what it is that we're invited into um, in heaven. And so this is the Catechism reference uh, 221. And it says that God is love. God's very being is love. So, so love, by its nature, wants to give, wants to be shared. So God, His very being is love, by sending His only Son in the spirit of love, in the fullness of time, God has revealed His innermost secret. So by sending His Son and sending the Spirit, He has revealed to us His innermost secret. So what is the innermost secret of God? This is, the, the Catechism tells us, God Himself is an eternal, eternal exchange of love. So this is what His nature is. His nature is, is love, and this, this love is eternal, and it's an exchange. And when we think about this word exchange, um, eternal it obviously means that it, it has no beginning, has no end. It's, it's always. Um, this love is always occurring. And, and to have an exchange, when we move to the eternal exchange, to have an exchange, you have to have more than one person. Um, if I were to exchange money, you know, at a bank, if I were to change uh, currency, um, or if I were to exchange something um, at a store, maybe a good that I didn't want, and I were to exchange it for my money back, I would have to have um, the vendor and obviously the customer. So there'd be two people in, involved in this exchange. So what, what, the exchange that we're talking, this eternal exchange of love, which is the innermost secret of God, it says is between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So in this exchange, we have the three persons of the one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's this exchange between this eternal exchange of love. That's what the Trinity is. The Father is the lover. He's the source of all love. The Son is the beloved. And the Holy Spirit is the shared love between. So we know that this is the innermost secret of God, that the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, is an eternal exchange of love. And this is the part that's real important to us. And He has destined us to share in that exchange. So... God, in His love, being love, wants to share, and He creates us out of that love, for our own sake even. He, he loves us, and so what He does is He invites us into this exchange. Because in its eternal exchange of love, 
there, there's a few things that have to happen. This is going to be a continual exchange. Um, when we enter this, this will be eternal. This will be for all eternity. This is what heaven is. And so the question is, how do we get into this exchange? How, how are we, how does God the Father invite us into this exchange, this eternal exchange of love? And if we think for a second, how, how do we enter into a family? Um, the family, probably more than anything, um, I guess really is an analogy for the Trinity. Because you have the, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. You have a husband, a wife, and the children. Um, even though it's not a perfect analogy, the family is this a shared exchange of love. It's a temporal exchange of love, but it's still an exchange of love. The husband loves the wife, the wife loves the husband, and in that shared love, children um, are, are obviously the, the offspring of that. And so it's an exchange of love. In a family, how do you get um, incorporated into a family? Usually this happens by marriage. <clears throat> and in this case, the same thing happens. If we see the son, it's the son, Jesus Christ, that will marry us. Jesus Christ is the groom. And so how are we going to get into this exchange of love? Well, Jesus, it says in the Psalms that your builder will marry you. So God, the Father who loves his people, will, will marry his creation. He will marry us. How does he do that? He does that through the Son. Um, so the Son, Jesus Christ, who is the groom, is going to marry the church, which is the bride. How do we get into this eternal exchange of love? It's through our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's through our relationship with His church. And so it's this connection right here between bride and groom, Jesus Christ and the church, that the two become one. We become one with the, with the body of Christ. We become one with Christ. He is our head. We are the members. And we are then incorporated into the life of the Trinity. Um, this, this most perfectly happens through baptism. So we're going to kind of then just backtrack here for a second. We're starting with where we're going. God has destined us. It says very clearly in the Catechism that He has destined us for this eternal exchange of love. So how are we going to get there? We know that we have to do it through the church. It's our connection to Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus Christ that we are brought into our oneness with Him. Our connection to His life brings us into the life of the Trinity. So how are we going to get into this? How are we going to get into the church? Let's just go back a little bit um, over here. The, the, the ultimate way, obviously, is, is through our baptism. So, our baptism will bring us into the life of the church. And there's going to be a, quite a few things that, that we'll fill in here. Um, but baptism is necessary to be incorporated into this church. Uh, baptism is necessary also to have the divine life living within us, to be restored back to the friendship of God, and to have that grace indwelling in us. So, so baptism is necessary for this, uh, for that incorporation into the church. Um, so we'll talk just a little bit about um, our, what happens at our baptism. When we're, when we're at our baptism, there's several different things that happen in the rite. There's several different symbols. But I want to focus on one symbol, and that's going to be the white garment. We're given a white garment, and uh, usually if it's a baby, then the baby might even be wearing this garment. Um, if it's a child or maybe an adult, maybe they're wearing white to symbolize the white garment. But, but whatever, the, whatever the case is, there, there is a part in the, in the rite that says, the priest or the deacon will say, you have been given this white garment, with the help of your parents and godparents, bring this white garment unstained, unstained into everlasting life. So, so we're called, at our baptism, we're called this, this beautiful symbol of what is our whole life is about. It's to take the white garment, and, and what is the white garment? The white garment is Christ. We put on Christ. Just as the priest um, puts on the alb and puts on the vestments. We have put on Christ in our baptism. 
And Christ is represented by this white garment. And it's this white garment that we are called to, with the help of our godparents and our parents, and then of course our friends and eventually our spouse and the other people in our life, we are called to take this white garment unstained into all eternity. Um, of course, all eternity, um, heaven has been also called the wedding banquet. That's another um, you know, image of, of what heaven will be, a wedding um, banquet. And there is a scripture, um, there's a parable that Jesus talks about, about a wedding banquet in which there's a, a person that shows up at the wedding feast and he is not wearing the proper garments. Um, because he's not wearing the proper garments, he's actually cast out um, and it says there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So, so with that, if we do not arrive at the wedding feast with this garment, then of course we won't be able to go to the wedding feast. We were not allowed, we will not be allowed to enter into heaven if the garment is stained. Our call of our baptism is to bring the garment unstained. And so Jesus Christ, in his mercy, he would never want us to arrive into this wedding feast with stains on our garment. If, if through our own personal sins, through our own actual sins, if we have stains on our garment, Christ and his church are going to give us every single means necessary to make sure that our garment is spotless. To make sure that when we see our groom, you know, think of a wedding. When a bride walks down that aisle, she does not want any stains on her dress. When she walks down that aisle, she wants to meet her groom, and she doesn't want to be embarrassed at all by any type of stain that she would have. If for some reason she's getting ready and she has a stain on her dress, she would either wash that stain or she would go get a new dress immediately, but, but she wants to save herself that embarrassment, that embarrassment of walking down the aisle. And, and, and the same thing is true of God's mercy. In His mercy, He wants us to arrive at what we are destined for with a completely spotless gown, ready to see our groom face to face and ready to enter into this eternal exchange of love. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about how does this happen. How are we going to, through our baptism, being given this white garment, how are we going to get this white garment completely here without spots? And there's a few things that happen. When we sin, there's, there's, there's two things that happen. Sin is a separation from God. So we can't have an eternal exchange. We can't have an exchange if we're separated. So sin is a separation from God. Um, and, and, and what we want to do then is we want to eliminate that separation. But with a sin, we have two things. We have an eternal punishment. And then also we have a temporal punishment. The eternal punishment due to sin is hell. And so we say, well, well how, how is that going to be satisfied? How is that going to be taken care of? This eternal punishment, okay, hell, due to our sins, has been taken care of by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has taken care of that by his passion and his death on the cross. And so Jesus takes care of this. That's what he does. When he says on the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Think about the Father hearing that request from the Son. The Son is in agony, and the Son is crying out, Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. Through His passion, He has paid this eternal punishment. On the cross, He paid that eternal punishment. Why is He able to pay the eternal punishment? Because He is eternal. Remember, Jesus is both God and man. And so he is the only one able to pay the eternal punishment due to sin. Now, we are temporal beings. And so what happens is we, are, we do have to pay for our temporal punishments. How is this taken care of? This is taken care of through forgiveness. Jesus, uh, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. When we go to confession... When we go to the sacrament of confession and we get absolved of our sins, we, those sins are gone. They're completely gone. So the sin is gone. 
What remains, however, is the punishment. Now, this punishment is taken care of by Jesus, but, but the temporal punishments still remain. Another way we can think of this is the damages done to sin. The damage, um, the effects of sin. A good way to kind of illustrate this would be if you think of a fence in your backyard. And, and maybe in that fence, every time you sin, it's like putting a hammer, putting a nail, hammering a nail into that fence. Each one of these nails represents a sin. And when we go to confession and we get that absolution, we take those nails out. Every single one of those nails is now taken out. And the sin, or the nail, is taken out. But what remains? There's now going to be holes in this fence. There's going to be spots, in a sense, if we want to say, on our garment. There's going to be these stains. There's going to be these, these impurities. Now we know that nothing impure can get into heaven. Nothing impure can get into heaven. We are called to bring the white garment spotless into heaven. So with this, we've taken the nails out. The sins have been absolved. The sin is gone. But the damage, the effect, if you want to say the punishment is still there. Now, since Jesus Christ... You have to remember that it's, it's our connection right here. It's our connection between Jesus and the church. Where is the church born? The church is born at the cross. Jesus Christ pays for our sins at the cross. He shows that there's no greater love, right? The beloved shows his great love by dying on the cross. And from his side, when blood and water flow, the church is born. And so everything, all merit, all graces are going to flow from the cross. It's going to flow from our bride, our groom, Jesus Christ. Now, this cross is the reason why we are able to have absolution from our, of our sins. The temporal punishments still remain. So now the question is, how do we take care of temporal punishments? We know how to take care of the eternal punishment, absolution. We know how to get rid of the sin absolution, going to confession. But the damages, the effects still remain. Okay, the white garment is still here, but the stains are on the garment. How do we get rid of those stains? There's going to be basically three ways that this happens. And the way we can remember it is G, P, S. Good works, prayer, and suffering, or sacrifice. Okay, and the church calls these three things penance. So when we say our act of contrition, we say that, you know, that, that we're sorry for our sins, that we resolve to sin no more, that we're going to go to confession, but we also say that, that I'm going to do penance. Why do we do penance? We do penance to make up, to pay for, to satisfy the temporal punishment due to our sin. The sin is gone, the temporal punishment remains. Every time we do a good work, a prayer, and, and sacrifice or suffering, what we do is we eliminate these things. We eliminate those things. Now, when we do these, and we apply it to this, it's called an indulgence. The indulgence is the removal of temporal punishment due to sin. So an indulgence is just simply removing this temporal punish this this temporal punishment due to our sins. The sin has been committed, the sin has been absolved, the punishment remains, and the indulgence is then removing. Um, when we have stains on the garment, it's removing those stains. There's two types of indulgence. There's a partial and a plenary. The partial is obviously partial, and the plenary is full. This is the full removal. We have to remember our goal. Always keep in mind our end. We have a loving Father that wants us as soon as possible, as soon as possible to get to this eternal exchange of love. If He wants us and He has destined us to be here, He is going to give us every 
absolute way to get here as quick as possible. And so, he gives us his son, he gives us the church, he gives us the cross. Through that cross, our sins are able to be forgiven, but also the punishment due to our sin, the effects, the damages due to our sin, are able to be satisfied. Why? Through our good works, our prayer, our suffering, and our sacrifice, which are all called indulgences. And they either remove this partially or in full. The church is able to grant these indulgences because the church is one with Jesus Christ. Now, in regards to penance, we have to just ask a few questions. And, and, and just really think about these questions and discuss these questions. When we do good works, when we do good works, are we doing them alone? Absolutely not. Jesus says, there is only one that is good. All good works come from the cross. When we do a good work, it is never alone. When we do a work, we are joining in the work of Jesus Christ. When we do any type of good work, we are joining in the one good work of Jesus Christ. We are connecting ourselves to the cross, and because of that, it's that saving power that is removing the punishment due to our sins. When we pray, we never pray alone. We always pray with Christ. It says that the Holy Spirit is helping us to pray. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're actually praying the very words of Christ. When we pray the Psalms, when we do Liturgy of the Hours, when we pray the, the Mass, all of these prayers are the prayers of the Church, and the Church cannot be separate from Christ. So when we pray, once again, all of our prayers are united to the cross, and because of that, the merits from the cross are able to then take away the, the punishment due to sin. Anytime we suffer, anytime we sacrifice, there is no greater suffering. There is no greater sacrifice than to lay down your life for a friend. This is what Jesus says to us. So our sacrifices are connected to his sacrifice. And because of that, they're redemptive. Because of that, that we enter into the saving work of Christ which not only saves our souls, but saves the souls of others, and it also removes the temporal punishment due to sin. There are several scripture verses, but one of them is that the righteous man, right? The, the, the works of the righteous man atone for sin. <clears throat> so there is the idea that, or the teaching, that our good works, our prayer, and our suffering and sacrifice um, connected with Jesus Christ, obviously because we're the church connected with Christ, bring about the removal of temporal punishment due to sin. Remember, forgiveness has already taken place. <clears throat> we, we must go to confession. We must have absolution. But what we're talking about here is the damages due to that forgiven sin, the sin that's already been forgiven. Now, one, thing, one other thing that just we can talk about here is When we talk about temporal punishment, there's two places that are temporal. One is earth, and the other is purgatory. So, if, if, if we've been baptized, we've been incorporated into the church, we have our white garment that has been given to us by our baptism, and we've been asked to bring this white garment into the wedding feast without spot on it and we've been forgiven our sin. So we're talking about someone that has, uh, has been forgiven their sins, but still has stains on their white garment, and they die. Okay, well they, they've, they've died, which is the first of the last things. They've been judged, they've been found worthy to be part of the church, and, and, and have lived out their baptismal vows. They have had their sins forgiven, but the damages of their sins are still there. So they're judged, and they're not going to go to hell, okay, because the forgiveness of sins has happened. They're not going to get the eternal punishment, but they still have stains on this garment. They will go to purgatory, okay? So purgatory is always connected to heaven. It's a place of purging. It's a place of preparation to, to get rid of all the impurities, um, all of those stains. And so, how long would we be in purgatory? Well, if we don't satisfy the temporal punishment due to our sins on earth, 
the only other option is to satisfy it in purgatory. And, and, and we don't want to do that. St. Therese says that God does not want purgatory for me. Um, and so I don't want purgatory for myself. We know what it's like to do good works, prayer, sacrifice on earth. We know how to get rid of this temporal punishment on earth. We don't know what that'll be like in purgatory. So it's best for us to not delay getting into here. To, to, to not hesitate at all. We don't want to spend any time in purgatory. God does not want purgatory for us, and so we should not want it for ourselves. The fact that there's purgatory means that God is merciful and just at the same time. Justice says that no one impure will enter into heaven. Um, his mercy says that you know, those that have been forgiven their sins will still be purified. In other words, His mercy is saying, I do not want them to enter in without a stain. I want them to be completely spotless. I want them to have no embarrassment, but be completely shining when they enter into this banquet. Um, one other thing we can talk about is, is, how does the church, when we talk about indulgences, how does the church have a right to give an indulgence? And we go back to the cross. You know, this is the center, the cross where Jesus dies for us. And, and from his side, remember, all graces are flowing from his side. All merits, all grace comes from the cross. Where is he going to put this? This is, this is an eternal. Remember, all this, this is without end. These merits and grace are just flowing and flowing, right? He's the, he's the, he's the fountain. Um, he says to the woman at the well, if you knew who was asking you for water, you would ask me for water because I am um, the eternal water, right? I, 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 it never ends. So the merits and the grace of Jesus Christ are eternal, and he has to put this somewhere. So he puts it within the church. Um, if you want to say it, it's kind of like he's making a deposit in the church, and the church is kind of like a bank. All of this grace, all of this merit is, is deposited in the bank. By our baptism, we have inherited an account. Okay, so we have an account in this bank. So how does the church have a right to give an indulgence? Well, one, it has the right because of its connection with Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ established a church. He, he deposited all the merits and grace into that church, and he gives the church the authority, guided by the Holy Spirit, to, to, um, to distribute these merits and grace. By our baptism, we are allowed then to withdraw, okay? Withdraw this merit, this grace, which is considered an indulgence. Um, how we do that, once again, is through our good works, our prayer, and our sacrifice. But remember, our good works, our prayer, and our sacrifice because we're in the church, are always connected to the good works, the prayer, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because the church, the bride, and the groom have become one. If we truly are one with Christ, which we are, then there is no work that's done separate from Christ, there is no prayer that's done separate from Christ, and there absolutely is no sacrifice done separate from Christ. Because of that, it's the work of Christ that's saving us um, every time we enter in. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.